It's the 10 to 1 podcast with your host, Brad Oman, featuring Ben Conowitz and Nate Laux. And here's the podcast. It's been a long week, but I don't know. Hey, it's a podcast. <laughs> the fuck are you guys I don't doing? Know. I yeah, don't seriously, know. is this a <laughs> delicious <laughs> dish over here? Yes, that's what I'm doing. They didn't wait, even wait, make wait. an SNL movie about that. You dumb they bastard. Should've, they should have. But Ben and I are so good at this that we might get jobs on NPR. We don't know. Yeah, you're so good at what? Just just yeah, talking. Just yeah, like I'm pretty sure people at NPR like do research. Our voices on things. are very good. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a face for radio as my good phone voices. Yeah, an ass for radio too. <laughs> it does. It's your face. It's, it's handsome Dan time. <laughs> there it is. Hey. <laughs> but here's the here's the joke, guys. He's not handsome. And 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 screaming. Does Screaming Dan? What what is Handsome Dan? And Handsome Dan and Mr. And Scream. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Scream. That's right. And why are we talking about Handsome Dan and Mr. Scream, Brad? Well, because this is a Saturday Night Live podcast. Yes, it is. And even though we would normally be talking about new episodes of Saturday Night Live, recapping them, reviewing, talking about the sketches, uh, there are no new episodes of Saturday Night Live yet. Not only are they on hiatus for the summer and... Uh, and whatnot, but and possibly the rest of our lives. We don't know. Uh, that, well, maybe, but that's because there is a writer strike and a Screen Actors Guild strike going on. And the on world right now. is ending. Uh, and so, even if it was Thanks, time, global warming. Even <laughs> even if it was time for new episodes, uh, we wouldn't be able to get them because there are strikes happening, and there wouldn't be new episodes coming to your television. So instead, we've been going through the library of Saturday Night Live movies chronologically through the order in which they were released. And we started with Blues Brothers, and we did Wayne's World, and we did Coneheads. And now, because Wayne's World was such a big success, we have circled back, and we are... One year later. Yes, back in Aurora for Wayne's World 2. This came together very quickly after the success of the first movie because it was such a box office hit, and people loved it so damn much that Paramount was like, hey, we want another one of those. And that's, that's just this brass tags here. Do you guys love this film as much as the first one? Uh, no. No, no, it's it's not as good as the first one. I think it comes close. I think it's very funny. It does not. I think it comes close. I think it's very funny. <laughs> it, doesn't. it doesn't. I think it comes close. <laughs> I think it's very funny. Um, it's uh, my. I think if I have one issue with it is that it does lean a little too much into the parody stuff, where they're they're making um making references to other movies and parodying, doing like spoofs of of things from other movies as well. But to be to be fair, it's not that they're doing that. It's that they're doing it without real purpose it doesn't really f- they're kind of shoehorning them in a bit that's, yeah that's how i feel about it yeah yeah i i would i would agree with that like the the jurassic park bit doesn't feel like it really makes much sense it was very timely because jurassic park was a big hit the year this came out but then the 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 wedding scene the from stuff the, with the graduate the, stuff it, at the it worked, end is, and, it, and it did move the plot yeah exactly whatever weird plot it was at that point in the movie but yeah. it still did its job yeah and so it's uh it loses some of its charm and, and in a way it kind of operates in the same way that a repetitive snl sketch does it's like it's very funny the first time oh let's do it again and it's like, oh, okay, if, it's not as funny this time. If Wayne's World is a 10, then Wayne's World 2 is an 8, in, no, no. My, in my opinion. I, I would say it's a 91. A 91 out of 10? Yep. Wow. <laughs> okay. Good for you, buddy. 91 out of 100. So a, a 9.1 out of 10. And, and Nate, if Wayne's World's a 10, and I say it's an 8, and Brad says it's a 9.1 or a 91 out of 100. Yeah, yeah. 60%. Whoa. 60%? Maybe 65. Six, that's a D, bro. Six out of ten? I know, 10? but it, it's better than like half. <sighs> Ugh, you're gross. Okay, I, so I'm I'm clearly the no, in but the I, I wasn't I wasn't equating it to grades. Like I wasn't saying that. No, no, that. but you're saying if if the original Wayne's World is a 10, it's, this is only a 6? I don't think it's close six? to as good as this. Wow, no, but the 6 is, I mean, that's, that's almost just, half as bad. You're kind of a bummer. You're a bummer, dude. Okay, but I, I find 7. Where do you, where do you get your joy from? <laughs> Did you hear him? What did he say? Uh, I find 7. Wow. I mean, you can pull it Stick to your convictions. Island. Yeah. I just don't know. I, I don't know. It's a 6 to 7. You, you don't like Chris Farley? Love Chris You don't like Kevin Pollack? Kevin Pollack's fine. You don't like Kim Basinger? I couldn't look at Kevin Pollack's eye. Yeah, I know. Well, that's because you're awkward. You know who awkward. I do love? Ed O'Neill. Oh, I love Ed O'Neill. Who doesn't love Ed O'Neill? Uh, Why did they come to me to die? <laughs> Why did they come to me to die? So, yeah, as we said, the sequel comes pretty quickly uh, after the first movie, um, but it is under a new director. And yeah. the you Now, you, you had the pleasure of interviewing the director from the, the first Wayne's World. You are what we call in the business of Fancy Fans McGee. 
Yes, that's a very, very technical like, term. Like if, if Nate and I were at the Aerosmith backstage, we would be with Bob Odenkirk and yep. uh, um, our, Robert Smigel. Robert yeah. Smigel. Our and girls would, would go in there, we and, would And not. you would be in the actual VIP. Yeah. Hey, a lot of people's girlfriends are in there. <laughs> so, so tell us uh, uh, why you think that uh, she, she did not return for the sequel. Well, not only will I tell you why, why I think she didn't return for the sequel, I'll tell <laughs> you exactly why she didn't return for did the sequel. Did she tell you? Like, did she talk no, about No, no, we didn't, we didn't talk about the sequel. She you was know? like, fuck him. And honestly, she's at a point now where, like, it's there's no, like, beef there anymore. Yeah. But during the first Wayne's World, there was some clashing between Mike Myers and Penelope Spheris. Uh, some, most of it having to do with creative opinions. Um, some of it having to do with Mike Myers not really knowing how to operate on a, uh, a studio movie set as opposed to the set of Saturday Night Live. Um, a lot of times, you know, there, there's so much planning that goes into a movie because you have to move around lights and just, set, just set pieces, blocking and all these things. And yeah. Just, yeah, all of this stuff. And so you can't just suddenly come in the day of or like an hour before shooting with like new script pages and expect to like get them out and, there and immediately. Do you, do you think that was literally constant? Oh yeah, she that that was one thing that she specifically told me on on the set of Wayne's World is that one of the more frustrating things was that she would like suddenly have these new pages from from Mike Myers uh, to do, and it's like, well, that's not how this works, you know. Well, and and it's not how that works in in that place, but we we do know other films where directors and and the and the stars and the writers oh, are course. all kind of on board for that, yeah, right? Where, but but not everybody is prepared for sure. the environment that yeah. Saturday Night Live sure. brings to the sure. table. The I was listening to a podcast recently, Brett Goldstein's piece, uh, Greg, Brett Goldstein's podcast, uh, films to be buried with, and he talks about he's talking with Jason Sudeikis, and Jason talks about one of the things he had to learn on making Ted Lasso is that not everyone, whether it's the director or other creative people or the actors that are involved, are as comfortable as he was with late changes because well, he and, was and he let was me just change the show at the last minute. Think about that when you are a, uh, you you do come from an, an SNL or an SCTV or a Groundlings or a Second City background where you can you can go with it. Now imagine just an actor. Who has been studying these lines for yeah, three weeks? Went to school for this, you know, and, and then oh, by the way, I need you to say this entire monologue instead of that. Now go learn that in a fucking. Yep. We cut that trailer whole scene. In, in, we're we're in cutting that whole scene. We're going to go a whole different language. That would be really hard if you're yeah. not used to it, right? Yeah, and and uh, conversely, it's really hard when your whole creative experience as an actor has been Saturday Night Live, which was Jason Sudeikis' experience, other than improv, you know, troops. And it's it's like going to be frustrating both ways. Now he feels stifled because he can't. Oh my God! This is so, such a better joke, and we have to. There, we there's a sit joke on it? there. We need to change. Yeah. Oh God, know? that would kill me. Um, and so I, I would imagine Mike Myers kind of had the same experience. Yeah. In that, there, if there's, we serve the jokes essentially. Of course. Right? If there's a better joke, let's make the joke. I mean, on Saturday Night Live, you got to remember, even today, they will. Uh, there was I read that the uh, the the unauthorized autobiography or of, of Saturday Night Live uh, um, uncensored, and back when like they were doing it with like Norm Macdonald or whatever. The, the one of the writers would be under the desk, and if something topical happened, he would write it on a sticky note and put it up there, and then he could read that joke right then and there. Like that's incredible, right? Yeah. Where you're on air and you're making changes like that. And of course, we, we talked about on Saturday Night Live famously, Stefan's character played by Bill Hader, uh, John Mulaney would purposefully change the the cue cards yeah. to make him laugh right yeah that's not happening on a movie set most likely no of course um but uh, aside from that you know uh, those creative differences and whatnot happen but there have been stories uh that came from this movie and have come from other movies since then that mike myers is also a little bit of a diva that he's just difficult to work with period regardless it's, it's of, one thing to be protective of your characters there's another to be really hard to work with yeah and so uh he they th these kinds of things have always kind of been denied and whatnot uh you know and so so, by Mike Myers. Yeah, but there have been several different people, several instances from several movies talking about how he is just uh, tough to work with and can be full of himself. But man, I mean, can you imagine the creator of the love guru being hard to work with? Mike Myers and Dana Carvey, as much chemistry as they have in these films and in these sketches that they make... I don't always get the impression that in real life they're the best of friends. Well, there was a time I think that they we talked about this on the yeah, Wayne's yeah so, World yeah one, so there right? there was a rift on the first movie and I think that they they had a little bit of a falling out at one point. Now they are fine, much in the same way that Penelope Spheris and Mike Myers have also buried the hatchet and they're it, fine too. And it does seem like if, listen if if Dana Carvey who in 1992 was also at the top of his game like like Aerosmith they were both peaking as rock stars in, in their respective careers. If if uh, Dana Carvey didn't want to do that movie, then he doesn't do that movie. He's got opportunities. Yeah, he, he must have been comfortable with Mike 
after the first one, they must have buried that hatchet. But I had read, or, even or they the, or they gave him a lot of money. But I read in the second one though, the Kim Basinger p- plot line there is specifically because Dana Carvey complained that I don't have anything. Yeah, to it, do it, was, it was. It was in the second one. Yeah, it was a similar thing. See, so it happened yeah. again. Okay, well, yeah. I'm sorry. I, then I'm wrong. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know if it was fixed. I don't know if Michael Myers. <laughs> I don't know if Mike Myers does it specifically, or if it's just he only is concerned about his own character. Exactly, yeah. it, 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 everything else is an afterthought, yeah. right? Yeah. And by the way, Michael Myers is fine. You can say that because his name is Dana Carvey, so carve uh, like geez. a knife, carve with a knife. Uh, Michael Myers yes, Carvey. Listen, enough. we're here all week. That's enough. Uh, is it though? That it's is. Ho- it's almost Halloween time. It's spooky season. So, speaking of the writing and the decisions that were made to change again to give Dana Carvey a different role or a different kind of narrative in this. Yeah, who who wrote this? Mike Myers. Mike Myers wrote it, and uh, along with uh, Bonnie, Bonnie and, and Terry, Terry Turner. Turner, uh, husband and wife. Yeah, they've written a lot. But if if I'm right, Brad, they Mike Myers actually had a different different film written, correct? Yeah. So initially, uh, when Mike Myers was writing the script, he wrote something completely different that was based on a classic British movie. Uh, and so I'm going to read a little bit from the trivia from uh, Wayne's World 2's IMDb page here. Uh, in December of 90... 90- hey, hold on. You, you have verified, though, that this is not just IMDb trivia. No, this is 100% true. Okay, this, gotcha. this is like a famous kind of like showbiz story. We all love IMDb trivia. Yeah. But, there's, there's a lot of bullshit out exactly. there. But this is very much true. Uh, in December of 92, Meyer submitted his first draft of the script for the sequel, and it was loosely based on a movie called Passport to Pimlico, which is an old British comedy that Mike Myers really liked when he was a kid. Uh, in this version of the movie, Wayne and Garth would have discovered an ancient scroll, formed their own country, and seceded from the United States. When Paramount discovered that the draft was similar to the, what was an Oscar-nominated screenplay, they realized they couldn't get the rights to be able to have Wayne's World 2 based on this script in time when production was supposed to begin very shortly. And so uh, this was in April of 93 that he found out that the script was unacceptable and the studio had only two months before they were scheduled to start shooting. So sets were being built, all that that jazz. And so Sherry Lansing, who was the CEO of Paramount at the time, uh, basically laid into Mike Myers, like yelled at him in her office. And this is what it says here. It says, she said, quote, how dare you? How dare you put us in this position? We'll sue you. We'll take your fucking house. You won't even own a fucking home. As I'm sitting here with you, there's a team figuring out how they can take every single thing away from you. And then she's- I've said that to Ben so many times. (laughs) Oh, that's why we still have the podcast, because I've, I've threatened to quit so many times, and here we are. And so then she continued, if I were you, Mike, I'd go to Lauren's office right now and stay there until you come up with a new script. We'll slide food under the door. Oh. Good oh. God. Oh. Sherry Lansing. Oh, she bad sounds, ass. Yeah, seriously. She like Don't me. fuck with Sherry Lansing. <laughs> uh, so uh, they, they yeah, gave- they, That's probably somebody's grandma. And she's like, did you want some more cookies? <laughs> and then little Cindy's like, oh, thank you. And she's like, I'll slide them under the door. <laughs> so they uh, they gave Mike Myers some time to work on a new script. Uh, but he, I want to know how much time. Well, so this says here he that in May he got married and went to Paris on his honeymoon. So that's a month after they found this out. So he had at least a month. Uh, and then, they, but then they agreed to push back the start date. So he, I would imagine he probably got at least another month to to finish. And the so script. they they had the original script. Mm-hmm. They didn't or did start shooting. The, no, they hadn't started shooting. But they had started building sets. Right. And wow, yeah, that's that, I had never heard that before. That's crazy. Yeah, it's pretty pretty nuts. Yeah, I think they did a table read and everything. Like they oh, they were man. ready to make this other film. Yeah, like like Chris Farley had already recorded his lines as Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little inside baseball for you it is it's true uh so yeah and um that so that didn't happen obviously we got a completely different movie here where uh wayne and garth decide to put on a rock concert called wayne stock in aurora illinois uh and and, and the rest is history as it so were. uh well that's that's a lot to take in right there um so we, we know that different director because mike myers is kind of a prima donna a bit and very protective of his characters garth uh the character not given a lot so dana carvey not not happy but ultimately had more to do uh script rewrite in a couple of months at least uh so but the the, the finished product on screen though 
isn't is not a shit show. It, no, not at, it, no, not a, at all. It's a good movie. As a matter of fact, it's almost as funny as the first <laughs> one. <laughs> no, I would say it's about sixty percent May, as funny. What is what are some of your more more favorable parts of this film? Like what, what do you like about this? If it's a six well, out of there, ten, there, for you, there's what, a what lot you, to like about this film. I, I and, and maybe six is too low. I I was thinking see. Six is fine. Um, oh, so you got a lot of D's, and you were like, "This is this is fine." Actually, hey, I mean, that's D's get degrees. That's that's how I. Well, Ben, you you just you're fucking dumb. <laughs> Thank you. I know. <laughs> uh, if, I, a, if I knew what that meant, dumb, we'd have, we'd, we'd have a problem. <laughs> I still say this: that Garth is the best part of every every Wayne's World sketch. Oh, Mike Myers is listening right now. He uh, hates it. That's fine. That's fine. Mike Myers suddenly got indigestion. He is he not. Was. Mike Myers just became Michael Myers. Uh, <laughs> Garth is so Dana Carvey is it's, so it's, it's a perfect character so funny in these he does such good facial work for comedy he's a great physical if comedian. they made a movie about Garth it would have been Napoleon Dynamite before Napoleon yes, Dynamite happened yes and and a lot of these things that that they did back then were ahead of their time honestly and yeah. and, and this movie is no exception but Garth Algar as a character is ahead of its time yeah the scene where he finally sleeps with Kim Basinger's uh, uh and he comes out of the bathroom with the Cary with Grant the pipe. impression yeah <laughs> and he's he's yeah he's he's given that deep voice and it it made me laugh when i was you know what 14 watching this 13 and it still makes me laugh so hard I when think i watch that, it i think that one of the more um like one of the more endearing qualities about the the movies, uh, the first and the second one, the relationship that Wayne and Garth have, they're very supportive of one another. Even when, when, when Wayne's mad and he's, I guess I'll just stay here and lick the cat's butthole. And they're like, okay, like <laughs> okay. it's not, it's not like, well, screw you, man, I'm out of here. Yeah, it's like, well, that's weird. Did you want to go? Like, they, they, there's no way that Garth ever gets mad at Wayne. Well, in the first one they do. Well, yeah, but sure, not, but, but not this one. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. overall, they there's so much love there for. It, it's one of my favorite parts about it, actually. And when their bromance, Garth happens. tells Wayne, "What? What's? How does he phrase it? I, I'm no longer a stranger in the ways of the lady or ways of the woman." Yeah. Yeah. And so then, good work, my friend. Good, yeah, and that's all it is, right? It's very, it's very cute. It's very easy, and it's not meant to be this like we're going to sit down and talk about this, but it's just an, a wink and a nod, like, okay, I get it. And you move on. And they got to focus on just being a comedy rather yep. than delving into like the emotional core of these characters, which is not what you want out of a Wayne's World film. I'm sorry. We want to keep it decently surface level, but there's still a little, you know, like it's enough there for me, honestly. They love each other. When, again, uh, Kim Ga Kim Basinger's character wants him to shoot, you know, her husband. Yeah. Like that. And he comes out of the room with the gun and he doesn't know what to do with it. Again, the physical comedy that Dana Carvey was yeah. able to pull off is just magic. It's just so magic. good. It is, and it still makes me laugh so hard today. He is a dead man. <laughs> yeah. So also, something as crass as him standing at the bar and talking about his dad and mom, and then going swing, 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 and being able to pace it so that he catches that and then still doesn't break his story. It's really good acting. I mean, of course, it's, parents it's, hate music play at the appropriate level. Swing, swing, swing. It's so that's I I tried to do it actually. I paused it. <laughs> And I was like, let me see if I can just talk and then interrupt myself. And I, it was hard. Yeah. That's so good. <laughs> so freaking good. So my favorite part is Dana Carvey. He yeah, just, no, again, good. continues to just light up that character. My favorite part, Ed O'Neill. Really? Why did they come to me to die? Yeah, it's such Why a bit part, but I do love... Oh, I love, in the first one, he was I, one of my favorite yeah, parts of that I, I do love... It's hard to bring these kind of bit characters back in and give them something that they can find as magical as the first one, but Man, Ed O'Neill finds it's it, so good. a way to do it's it. It's so dark. I, and again, we uh, 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 this movie is very absurdist, right? There, there are so many absurd moments in this film, and that is one of them. Where it's like, why would you even have this in the film? It's one of the. It's so dark. I, I think absurdist is a good good word for this film, and one of the reasons that I didn't like it as much as the first one is the first one was a little bit Napoleon Dynamite, and you're telling a story about two very real weird characters, but they're real. They're real characters. They're grounded. They can do the things that they say they're doing. Yeah. But then you 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 put in Jim Morrison and a naked Indian. Yeah. And it, it gets the, the 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 bits are absurd in this one, whereas the premise was absurd. Of like, we're going to take this show and make yep. it a corporation. Yeah. That's just absurd. But well, these are no, real characters. Well, I don't know. I don't necessarily. I think that's absurd. If anything, I think that's maybe the most grounded thing is that someone sees Wayne's World and wants to put put it on like 
proper television and make it into a real show. And so like then they have to decide whether or not they really want to be sellouts and that kind of thing. The absurd part for the first one just comes from being the, Wayne and Garth. Being Wayne I mean. and Garth and breaking the fourth wall. And like but you don't ever have bits that are as absurd so, as, as they are as this one. The closest you get is that Terminator two bit with with uh T one thousand, you know. So, uh, so, but in here, like the the bits are are that are absurd are much more plentiful. But for me, sure. I don't mind because I like the idea of the world being more absurd around them as well. I think that in the first one, it, it is abs- it's an absurd thought for for Garth to say if you're going to spew spew into this and yep. it's a tiny little thing that's not a rational thought it's an absurd thing but, but it, that's Garth that's just Garth no, being no, a but, weird character but, but it happens in it, it's the it's the weirdness that's as absurd as that gets it's not yeah. a naked Indian and you of know, course you're, you're, this is like grease flying car level oh right? yeah yeah so that, yeah, it, it is way crazier you you brought up a good word there weird I think that's why I love these characters they're so weird and. It seemed like the second film was was moving away a little bit from their weirdness more to the absurdist. Uh, maybe it's a bigger budget do or whatever. You, do you find that uh, Cassandra's character loving Wayne because he's weird helps to to stay you a really, little bit? You, I because they're not weird she, and they're not weird and mean. Yep. they're not weird and the losers. They're just weird. And she, she being a very cool rock star and in love with Wayne, kind of helps ground that to say like these aren't losers. I just don't. I, I, I'm fine with it. I don't want to argue about it. But the Jim Morrison thing, I don't think is essential to this film. I think you can get them to do a rock concert or a rock festival without having the vision. It's a pretty big swing. Apparently, that's something that was inspired by uh, an some, actual some, dream. Something, yeah, something involving his dad actually, like that uh, a vision that no, his I dad had, or, or something like that. Not necessarily about Jim Morrison, but like that the concept of that. Was like well, that's like where the inspiration came came from. Something about that, um, but I don't I, I don't know I I don't I don't mind it. Just be like I said, you know I, I don't mind having them reach you know be a more absurd uh, level of comedy. Maybe this is being very uh, um, nitpicky, but I, I don't mind them. Ha- I don't mind Wayne having the dream. They revisit it three times. Did, yeah, did they need yeah, to keep going that, back? Maybe to that's it? right. Yep, yeah. H- having the dream and coming back. But then they Jim Morrison coming appears back. at the festival. Yeah, yeah. Right? It, like, it's just, it's a lot. It, it's it a just lot. seems. And, and, and it's a lot, it's a lot to have Cassandra's character just being, you know, out of nowhere kind of marrying Christopher Walken's character. So yeah, if there's, if there's a complaint, I guess, that I maybe have about this movie in that regard is that there's, they, they adhere less to the structure of a story than this one, even with the first one. Because the first one, they do the fake out endings. They do the same thing again here. But in this movie, you have the same turn that you do in the first one where, uh, where Cassandra turns against Wayne because Wayne goes overboard with like how jealous he is and like thinks something's going on with him and Christopher Walken as her producer. Uh, but then all of a sudden, aside from that fallout, then all of a sudden she's marrying Christopher Walken. And there's no real leap there because they don't really create much of a romance. Y- it's clear that Christopher Walken is interested, but there's no reciprocation from Cassandra. Yeah, it's almost like Mike Myers is a very jealous and controlling type of I hate person. It. I hate it. <laughs> it's weird that Wayne would be as well. Speaking of Christopher Walken. Oh. Uh, so great to have him in this role. I, he's a favorite of Saturday Night Live as far as hosts are concerned. Um, what, what a slicked back, you know, cool character yeah. villain, right? And uh, originally, though, they were going to bring Rob Lowe back as a completely different character. He wasn't going to play Benjamin again, but and, he was going to play a character named Philip. And that would have been hard to do. How do you think they might have tried to do that? Honestly, like, what, what would they have done? Probably play to the absurdist, right? Yeah, like, I mean, Mike, Mike Myers, like, he's the kind of person where, like, they would make a meta joke, something like asking, you know, like maybe saying something about him his, looking familiar. His, his twin or, brother, yeah, or something or, yeah, some, some weird. something weird like that, you know. So, uh, uh, Christopher Walken these days, you know, I remember seeing him in 2004 in Man on Fire, right? That's 2004. Yeah, he looked old then. Mm-hmm. This is only 12 years removed from Man on Fire. Yeah, and he looked young and vibrant and and I think, the, I think it's the hair color. It is, but also <laughs> he he looked the part. He could pull off that maybe he was a threat yeah. to stealing. Yeah, he girl, was right. He, he was clearly 10 years older than Tia Carrera or whatever. But like he still had it. He still had. And also, some, the character's shredding on the guitar. Yeah, yeah. He's very successful. Mm-hmm. You get the you know, Aerosmith backstage. You know, he he gets it right. Um, but this movie, I think, also does a very good job of not falling into that trap of 80s and 90s and even into the even into now 
where it's the it's almost the the damsel in distress and she's kind of silly and she's gonna fall for the guy cassandra's character was never interested romantically really uh, until obviously it gets right. really absurd at the end but for the for for 80 percent of this film 90 percent of this film Wayne's the one that is just way off base. Yeah, yeah, he's jealous. Yeah, yeah. And for no reason too, yeah. because there, she's not even thinking about that. He might be, but even he's not. He's looking at it to try to like get Cassandra away from Wynn, but it doesn't even feel like yeah, predatory. He, he had a gift in Cassandra, and he was gonna weasel it away. Oh. Yeah. What did you think of Cassandra's dad? That that plot line. I mean, it's it's funny, you know, and that's that's another thing that leans into the parody aspect of like he leans into a, like a kung fu movie parody, um, and having somebody like James Hong do it is is hilarious too because he's you know a, a screen legend uh, overseas, and so but putting him in that role is is really funny. The the voice that they use for the dubbing is hilarious too. I've always loved the voice. Is that, it? But I read that maybe that's him. No, no. So James Hong. He is he all he is famous for doing dubbing for movies gotcha, in Hong Kong. Gotcha. He didn't do the dubbing. Do you know for this who one. did his voice? No, I don't actually. H- uh, Hank Azaria. Nope. Jim Downey. Oh, Jim Downey. Really? Yep. As in uh, uh, Deep Thoughts, Jim Downey, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. As in SNL legend, Jim yeah, Downey. That's great. Uh, yeah, that that is great. Okay, if that is your custom, prepare to die. <laughs> so the um, uh. The, the Cantonese that they speak in the film and Mike Myers does a pretty good job of you know, obviously he doesn't speak Cantonese but he was it was a that's a fun back and forth right yeah um I I really enjoyed reading those subtitles and, and laughing along with the absurdity of him at, like, like he literally says the adults are talking when talking to Cassandra yeah. the father does and in America we let women make the choice and he's oh and that, <laughs> that that's the impetus for the fight right yeah the kung fu stuff is hilarious obviously. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed uh, that. wasn't out of place for me. It, that was uh, leaning into the absurd in the right way. Yeah. Before we uh, get too far ahead of ourselves, let's let's go back to the beginning and kind of maybe we can make our way through this movie by just focusing on cameos and talking about uh, the, the difference sure. we have because there are so many in this movie, even more so than than the first movie. There's a, there's a lot of SNL people in this movie. There's a lot of random, just familiar faces. Uh, and so in the very beginning, obviously we get Aerosmith, and uh, right. Aerosmith has a history with Wayne's World on Saturday Night Live because they were famously in one of the sketches uh, when Tom Hanks hosted. They appeared as themselves because they were the music guest they were supposed to be in the first movie or at least mike myers wanted them to be in the movie uh but the band turned them down they they for whatever reason didn't want to do it uh, it was the 90s and they were huge they didn't I mean, they were the biggest band on the planet in 91 92 you couldn't turn on MTV i don't want to see them thing. no that's that's 96 what you're, was, what you're was talking it? like um um uh, oh god uh Oh, what's the the, the the one that's the cow on the cover of the album? Get a grip. That's the one. Yeah, <laughs> I do love that. I remember Very that. I bought that album. Brad. Yeah, uh, but no, they were literally get a the, grip was ninety three. Yeah, the largest touring band in the world at the time, and they shut were, up and dance. That was in yeah. the, mm-hmm. the movie. Yeah. Huge. So living on the edge. So of course, if you're the biggest band in the world, you might not want to be in a in a in a Saturday Night Live movie, right? right? Crazy. But then by the second one, because then Wayne's World goes and makes one hundred eighty million. Mm-hmm. And now, oh, they, they're on my radar now. Yeah, exactly. So uh, Alice Cooper ended up doing the musical part in the first one. Aerosmith came in for this one, appeared in themselves. There's a moment when they appear where Stephen Darler looks directly at the camera because he's clearly not, you know, an actor. Uh, and it's it's a blinking and, 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 and he's moment. Probably on a lot of coke. He was not blinking, but he looked good though. Oh, so shredded. I mean, if that's what coke does, give me an eight ball. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, and then uh, we have uh, some cameos here in this scene as well. Uh, in addition to getting introduced to Christopher Walken, we have Heather Locklear appearing as herself, another staple uh, who is referenced to constantly on the Wayne's World sketches. Uh, and then we also she was kind of an it girl Melrose Place, right? Yeah, that huge, time. huge, yep. huge oh, yeah, it girl yeah. at the time. She was, uh, she was like the quintessential babe for Wayne yep, Gardner. Yeah, yep. she, she had uh, a lot of teenage boys had the poster of her on on their wall. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we have a couple cameos uh, from Robert Smigel and Bob Odenkirk, uh, who are on Saturday Night Live. For those who don't know, Robert Smigel is the voice of Triumph, the insult comic dog. He's done a lot of work with Adam Sandler. Uh, and Bob Odenkirk, I mean, at this time, he wasn't really much of anything. He had been writing on SNL. He'd done some TV stuff, but this was his first movie, right, Nate? Correct, yeah. He had, uh, him and Conan and Robert Smigel are very, very, those three are very, very yeah. close. And I think Bob Odenkirk, I, I listened to a behind the scenes on Conan podcast, 
And Bob Odenkirk actually helped write on the first season of Conan just to kind of get them started. Yeah. But he was, and, and that probably wasn't that much earlier than this. I think it was 91. So um, so you, you mean you mean Late Night with Conan O'Brien, right? Yeah, Late Night okay. with Conan O'Brien. Because yeah. uh, his first uh, real jump into uh, the television was Mr. Show with Bob and David, and that didn't come out until 95. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that show, that impacted me as a kid. Because uh, it was on HBO. Yeah, see, and, and I, never, I never, I never watched it. I know I people either. love it. Like, yeah, I, did, I didn't grow up with it, and I never, I, I honestly haven't even seen much of it t- today because I haven't taken. I, a look and back. I didn't grow up in a wealthy family that had HBO. Yeah. <sighs> <laughs> I watched HBO. I watched Mr. Show with Bob and David. It informed a lot of my comic sensibilities. Maybe even more than Saturday Night Live. I watched it a lot, and that was 95. I was 13, 14. So you were also staying up to watch Real Sex. (laughs) Oh, 100%. (laughs) And and Inside Herman's Head. Taxi Cab Confessions. Oh, you know it. (laughs) Autopsy, what? No, uh, (laughs) Alien Autopsy. um, There was a show on HBO called Autopsy. Oh, I know. They just followed a guy doing autopsies. I know. It was really creepy. And (laughs) the problem was it came out right after uh, Real Sex. So you had a real awkward bone. So it was real tough. (laughs) I got through it. So anyway... uh, no, no, but um, Mr. Show with Bob and David, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, it launched a lot of careers. Yeah. Paul F. Tompkins, Sarah Silverman, uh, um, Brian Posehn. Garth uh, Brooks. <laughs> Tenacious D. Jack mm-hmm. Black. Uh, yeah. 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 So just uh, 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 the guy that plays Jimmy Pesto on uh, Bob's Burgers that was at the insurrection and went to jail. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe he didn't go to jail, but he was at their insurrection, so he lost his job from Bob's Burgers. But still, I think his name's Jake James Johnson. Johnson. Ah, whatever. Doesn't matter. Long story short, Bob and David rules. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and so Bob oh. Odenkirk and Robert Smigel play the two nerds who are stuck backstage. Uh, and <laughs> I, it's great. I, I I love these characters just because they sound just so so goofy. And the uh, how long does it take you to get to Aurora? It takes me forty minutes door to door. My ma gave me a dollar and dropped me off at the park and ride. <laughs> there, in in my opinion, they could have came back in other scenes, and I would have loved to see them. Oh, oh yeah. absolutely. Yeah, they're, those are two. B- very bit characters that are fully fleshed out. Yeah, right? absolutely. It's great. Um, and so the, uh, we, we move 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 forward from here after the concert, um, and then Wayne and Garth figure out that they should put on their own concert after we have the the Jim Morrison dream. Um, and you don't have Jim Morrison played by anybody you know huge in this in this role, uh, but you do later get Tim Meadows as Sammy Davis Jr. Do, pulling out an, an old SNL impression, which is which is pretty fun. We all yeah. like seeing yeah. Tim Meadows pop up and stuff. And then you got oh uh, Kevin Pollock. Kevin Pollock pops up. Yeah, as one of the people who works at the uh, Aurora um, Parks, Parks Department. Yeah, department. Uh, which is a a great bit too. It is uh, with him having the partial he, ocular and, albino, and he's so serious about it. Like that again, the fully lived in character. Mm-hmm. I have twenty twenty vision. Like he's so he's he. I'm that, fine with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine with it. But the way he says it, he's clearly not right. Cross the T's and dot the <coughs> lowercase J's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, Oh, uh, so interesting. Really got an eye for detail. That kind of reminds me of the 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 moly moly moly. Yeah, moly, yeah, yeah that, from Austin when I Powers. watched it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a similar. Like you bit said there's sure. some recycled jokes that Mike Myers loves. Mike Myers do. likes re- yeah recycling uh, certain specific bits he has yep. used several times, like the um, what the French call a certain I don't know what. That's in Austin Powers. It was on SNL. He's brought a lot of jokes from Saturday Night Live and used them again. You know, and if they're funny, that's great. Uh, yeah. You know, but it's uh, and if they're not. Don't cool. do not do it. But that's what he likes to do. Um, earlier, we had uh, Rip Taylor make an appearance. As himself. Yeah, of course. Not, by the way, I, I was really kind of interested in Rip Taylor. When I watched this, I'm like, that's a weird guest to invite to a show, right? Like a, a, a rock show. I would love, as I read his Wikipedia page, I would love a movie, a, 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 a biopic. Oh, Rip my God. Taylor. That would be awesome. I, I think it'd be fascinating. I didn't realize how... Like he went to the military. He went, you know. Yeah, uh, he's like, yeah, it's a wild story. That's what I'm saying. Rip like he, Taylor should be played in that in that uh, biopic by John C. Riley. Yeah, I, that'd be great. I would love that. Yeah, I would. I would absolutely. It watch just that. seems like a character that I would love to hear their story. Yeah, exactly. Because all you think about is he's got a tube full of confetti, and he laughs, right? But yeah, and he's it, he's a gay man when right. it wasn't real popular exactly. to be a gay man. Mm-hmm. But you know. Holy shit! What a life! Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he like that's that's why they brought him into the Jackass movies because you know it's just a fun random appearance by yep. Rip Taylor. I love yep. it. Uh, so in the same scene with Kevin Pollock, we also have a new character 
uh, who become will eventually become Garth's actual Spoiler alert. romantic foil because the we also have Kim Basinger who plays someone who uh, gets caught up with him who inexplicably is attracted to Garth for whatever reason. And Dana Carvey wants- had to beg her to do this, and like she said no many many times. Yeah, and actually, so funnily enough, it was actually Alec Baldwin who convinced her. To do it. Alec Baldwin and Kim Basinger were married for a time, and Alec Baldwin is another recurring Saturday Night Live host that people like a lot. Uh, and he's he's like he's like no he's like what are you what are you doing like you you have to it's do hilarious. this like yeah, yeah. It's exactly and so and so she ended up finally ended up and loved it. it like she said she couldn't stop like she, she was amazed in an interview I read do you think that, that she, she was just nervous because she's not a comedian and that yeah she, she I think that's part of it is like this isn't my role yeah. this isn't my film because I feel like you would get more dramatic actors that literally only do drama you'd get more of them to do comedy if if they could understand that they they don't have to be the funny one yeah I listen to a lot of podcasts and no. Uh, Actors often say comedy is a lot harder than any other film. Oh, for sure. You know, well, and well, see, and that's the thing. It's because, a lot more because, intimidating to do because it. they think they have to be funny. But honestly, if they're the straight man, th- this kid could be hilarious. Yeah, I just guys, open yourself up. Come on. <laughs> so, so when we meet Kevin Pollock, we also meet this other character, Betty Jo, who basically is just a female version of Garth. Very, very awkward. Who's that actress? So I, I'm going to tell you here. Her name is Olivia Diabo. Um, and she's not necessarily super famous or anything like that, but weirdly enough, she has a connection to Star Wars because she voiced a Jedi character named Luminara Unduli uh, in the Clone Wars. And they even brought nerd. They even brought her back to reprise the voice in because at the end of Rise of Skywalker, which is dog shit, um, <laughs> they, they have a moment where Rey hears the voices of a bunch of different Jedi as they all kind of like empower her. And she literally reprises. Yeah, her they, role well, they, and they got a bunch of people from the animated shows well, and cool. from the other movies. So yeah, she got to do that there. Uh, but she's she's been in a bunch of other stuff. She, she's actually a pretty big uh, voice actress. She's been in... Say, uh, her, her her Wikipedia page is huge. Like, yeah. She's got a ton of work. She's been in a lot of uh, animated series and in, in, typically in just like bit parts and like a few episodes here and there. Star Wars, Batman, Green Lantern, that kind of thing. Uh, but she did have a, a series regular role uh, on a series back in the day. And I forget what it is and I'm trying to find it and I can't find it as quickly as I did before. So give me one second and I will do it. <coughs> Good, good job. She was oh. on the the Wonder Years. That's what it was. Thank you. Uh, she w- played the daughter of the Arnold family in the Wonder Years. Uh, Fred Savage's older sister. She played the daughter. She played the daughter of the yeah. of the Arnold the, family. The sister of. Fred oh Savage. wow! Yeah. Uh, and then for and for those you '90s kids, she was also the British teacher uh, in the Big Green. Nope. You didn't get it. It wasn't for you. Nope. No. For this was it was for the people who love Mighty Ducks and then were interested in a soccer movie because they like Disney sports movies, and that's not for you. Yep. I was into the big red. The gum? Yep. Did you like cinnamon gum? My dad did. Ugh. I hate cinnamon gum. No, it's fine. It's disgusting. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh so we also have uh Drew Barrymore. Making an appearance, yeah, looking Jürgen, Jürgen. incredible. Yes, uh, she was quite uh, another uh, another babe at this point. She, I think, she had done Playboy right around this time. Actually, probably. You think? Come on, topless you know. on Letterman around this time. Is that a thing? Yeah, she famously got up on his desk and and showed her tatas to David Letterman. Oh, I didn't know that. I mean, you don't see them. Her back is to the camera, but Dave, Dave got it. Don't Dave, tell Dave, me what my imagination can do. Dave got a look. He did. <laughs> of course, he did. Uh, and. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then we have uh, another cameo from Harry you know Shearer. Brad, they, the people in the audience were like, uh, uh, you know, don't do not do it, Drew. Don't show them. And then, you know what Dave said? Uh, let, let her, man. We we went back for that. Okay, sorry. <laughs> that was, you, you, you took a second. You I, thought, hold on a second. I got to go back. I'm going to stop the flow of the Let podcast. me make sure that I get this, this golden I, jam off. The longer it went, the more I was like, this is not going to land. But kind of like, like, like your sex life. I was, I was already pot committed at that point. Mm-hmm, yeah. So Handsome Dan. Uh, yeah, Handsome Dan. Uh, Wayne and Garth appear on a radio show. And uh, it is Harry Shearer, who you might know from The Simpsons, uh, voices Mr. Burns and tons of other voices on The Simpsons. Uh, he's uh-huh. also in Christopher Guest movies. Uh-huh. <laughs> Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Ooh, uh-huh. uh, and so uh, he's a very funny character. Uh, and then, of course, you have Ted McGinley playing Mr. Scream, uh, which is a great scream, by the way. It's a great scream. It's a really good scream. Ted McGinley, for those of you that maybe watch the show Shrinking, he plays uh, one of my favorite characters, the, the husband of Christina Miller's character, yeah. Krista Miller. Krista Miller. Sorry. And he wasn't he also he was the neighbor on Married he, with Children, he was right? The, yeah. the new, the new neighbor. Yeah. On there had two. Right. And he was the second one. Yeah. He was the second Becky. So him and Ed O'Neill. 
Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. I wonder if they talked. I, w- I mean, I don't think they probably weren't a scene. Yeah, either, so. I w- I now in my head they were though. Uh, well, that's fine. You can if you want to do that. Uh, Jay Leno appearing as himself. Yep. yep. Uh, with with uh, Tia Carrera on the Tonight Show with Jay Leno, of course. We have that. Um, we also uh, have Charlton Heston. Oh God, appearing that as scene himself is so good. Yeah, I I love that. So, it's one of my favorites. So that is the absurdist stuff that I'm here for. Yeah. It's super yeah. meta. It's brilliant. And and the it only tears works that Mike Myers has afterwards is just so it, hilarious. It only me. works when you have truly a guy that's gonna go for the scene and make it. Good. Yeah, and man, he really went for well, it. Well, my favorite, my my favorite thing about bits like this too is that it just comes out of nowhere. Like yeah. they're in the middle of a flow of doing this like scene of he's trying to get Cassandra, and all of a sudden he's like he's like. What what is this? He's like, he's like, do we have to? Put, I know this is a small part, but like, do we have to put up with this? I love it so much. <laughs> and so, funnily enough, the director uh, Steven Sergic, that's actually him who comes in and replaces the, the guy the, with oh, with Charlton oh Heston. The, the, the PA that yeah comes in. yeah he comes gotcha. in and, and moves the guy around and brings Charlton Heston in the in the credits. It says bad actor. Yeah, and that old man. I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> Al Hansen, bad, bad actor. actor. Yeah, but it, he's supposed to be. He, he knew. I, yeah, he understood the assignment. He got it. He got it. <laughs> um, and honestly, it wasn't that bad. It was just like he's delivering the lines normal. It's not. See, that's the other thing. It didn't do it like he didn't stutter through them or screw it up. He just wasn't as impactful as a Charlton Heston type. You, you could see how somebody could take two different scripts and do a totally yep. like because that was good actor. Again, seems like. it wasn't a terrible performance. It was just it was fine. No, but, well, but you, I think the moment is where you can see what it is and and. He he maybe is a little too good at, at doing this to seem like he's a bad actor, but he does. It's a point when he it's clear that he's trying to remember the lines. He's he's like he's like oh Gordon Street, uh, I once knew a girl who lived on Gordon Street, and that's when Mike Myers is like well like what what's gotcha. going on? <laughs> and see, I don't like movies that much, so I just didn't think that that was a bad performance. That's I mean you don't really know much about acting. Do you want to take that one again? Or? You don't really know much about acting. 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 <laughs> Ac- acting. Okay. Ben, why don't you like acting? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Jiminy. <laughs> uh, so I think that pretty much uh, much covers it because uh, we have Aerosmith who comes back at the end for Wayne Stock. Uh, do you know the band that got out of the limo at the end of the film? No, who was it? Brad? I don't. Did you remember that scene? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I it's, it's, a, it's a credit scene. Yeah, and I actually I tried to look this up, but I couldn't it's find the, anything the concrete. Gin blossoms. Oh, is that who? Yeah, that is, is it really? Yeah. That's a very '90s band. Yeah, it is a very '90s band. Uh, they they wanted to try to get Nirvana to be part of Wayne Stock, but apparently uh, they Kurt Cobain was an asshole. They passed on it. Yeah, he yeah. was kind of a dick. But could you imagine having Dave Grohl in Wayne's World? I mean, I mean, it would have been awesome. Yeah, now, now maybe Wayne's World three. Yeah, let's bring it back. Why not? They're not doing anything. Let's do it. No, it's time. It's time to let it end. No, no. I, Bill, Bill and Ted. Yeah, if we can the music do, was good. I'm pretty sure we've we're talking had about this, this conversation yeah. before. Keanu Reeves has aged much better than those other two. I think Dana Carvey still looks great. He's fine, but not near. <laughs> have you He's seen? Fine. Have you seen a Mike Myers and B Keanu Reeves? Keanu Reeves does not age. He looks fair, fantastic. Fair. Fair. Mike Myers is definitely puffier. <laughs> It's, and that's okay. It happens. It's fine. <laughs> Some of us age. Yeah. So, guys, rank the films then. That you know, the films that we've watched. John where, Wick. <laughs> John Wick Two. <laughs> John, uh, so, the films that we've watched. What's your favorite? Still, oh, man, I don't know. It's still Wayne's World. Is yep. the still number one? Yeah. What do you mean? Why is it hard for you? It's not. It was, it's. We're not moving the number one, right? You're not going Wayne's World yeah. Two over Wayne's World One. It's Wayne's World, Coneheads, Wayne's World Two, The Blues Brothers. No. No, it is. No, I think it's it's Wayne's World, and then Blues Brothers. Whoa! And then didn't you put Coneheads above Blues Brothers? We last liked time? Coneheads. Yeah. No. I, yeah. Oh, wait, did I? Yeah. yeah I really did. don't remember. Did I? Yeah. But it's okay to change because because we established that we still very much like Blues Brothers. But oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, it was uh, it was because I did Wayne's World, Coneheads, Blues Brothers, but it was very close. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Oh, one of the things that we we didn't talk about is Del Preston. In in Wayne's World too, who has a very Michael oh, yeah, Caine yeah. accent. Yes, it's like, called being British, Nate. No, but it's a very <laughs> it's a very Michael Caine like um, pronunciation of words. So it's probably just because they're from the same place. And I wonder. Yeah, I had to get a hundred M and M's to fill a brandy jar, or Ozzy wouldn't go on stage that night. And that is a, a very famous uh, bit about brown M and M's, you know, in the writer. But but you know the real story behind it, right? Like that's what I'm referencing. 
Yeah. yeah but, it was only just to make sure that people had read the writers. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. yeah, because the idea was if they were not paying attention to that, what about the safety concerns yep. of the rigging? Yeah, and exactly. All that stuff? Yeah. And there was an incident when they did have a rigging that fell apart. Yeah, and it was so it's just making yeah. sure that people had read the writers. Yeah, exactly. Not to be a prima donna. Yeah, some people think that it is, but that's not the case. Uh, so Del Preston's played by Ralph Brown, who's a famous British actor. And funnily enough, this character actually was meant to be kind of a continuation of the character he plays in With Nail and I, uh, which is a... Uh, a, a I feel Fe- Ben loves. Oh my God, with uh, it's it's incredible. It's got Julie Andrews and Air Bud. <laughs> uh, so with Neil and I is actually like a, a cult favorite, actually. Um, and Richard E. Grant is the other person who's in this movie. You're making up names. <laughs> no, that's uh, old Loki. It is cl- it's oh. classic Loki from yeah from the first season of Loki, and he's very famous in other roles. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't do British humor, uh, but but so uh, actually, <laughs> for those of you, you you guys are Smartless fans. This is a movie that Will Arnett has name dropped a bunch of times. With Nail and I is, uh, is actually, we, I think we don't listen to Will I think Arnett. specifically he says this is his favorite movie of all time. Um, I I actually still haven't seen this, but I, I have heard that it is very good. Guess who's getting assigned it next time? Me. You can't assign it if you haven't seen it, and also when you assign movies, I don't even know if it's gonna be. The right, right movie anymore. Hey, oh, oh, no, don't whoa, tell me whoa. I can't assign films I haven't seen. Whoa, whoa. I've done it before. The, the, you guys were on the wrong podcast. You guys are having a Go Flicks Yourself discussion on the 10 to 1. Anyway, uh, and then uh, the other person that we did. Uh, I like how you guys just, you both are here figuring, oh, everybody listens to both. No, they don't. I don't care. Now, now they'll go listen to it because no, they'll they wonder how, why Nate's an idiot. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. listener. One person we also didn't mention because it's not necessarily a cameo, it's a supporting role. Uh, Chris Farley makes an appearance in Wayne's World 2 uh, playing a completely different character than he did in the first movie. First movie, he had a bit part as a security guard who gives Wayne and Garth some convenient information. But here he plays actually like one of the supporting friends who like is... Becomes a security guard. He becomes a, uh, a roadie. L- listen, bud. Yeah, but uh, a, he a lot of people's girlfriends are in there. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't let people in, so he's doing security there. And that actually brings about another parody moment from an officer and a gentleman where he's getting yelled at, because like, I got no place else to go. <laughs> he delivers that so it's well. So it's so funny. Did we mention Rob Lowe about he was almost in this? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure we covered no, that. No, that was, that was a good 30 minutes ago. <laughs> Sorry. Just want to make sure that we, I, we did cover it. I hate my father. I hate my life. But I feel great. <laughs> I'm going to go pick a fight. <laughs> He's gotten a lot better. <laughs> He's gotten a lot better. Uh, anything else that we forgot to mention? Yeah, Nate, is there anything else we forgot to mention? No, uh, but I don't think you finished your three and four film. Uh, like, So you've got... So, so uh, we, no, we just said that uh, you know, nothing has changed, right? So if it's Wayne's World and then Coneheads and then Blues Brothers, then it has to be followed by Wayne's World 2. No, he wants Wayne's World 2 above... Uh, I'm, I'm putting it above Blues Brothers. Not because Blues Brothers is bad. I just like Wayne's World 2 more I, because I love these characters and I love the movie. No, th- this is, the quote unquote, the worst of the, them, but it, but they're all good. This is right below its pat. Ha. <laughs> all, no, all these movies are good, so ordering them is yeah, tough. No. But gets, this, one, this one is my least favorite out of, the, out of the four so far. It gets worse and worse as we go, doesn't it? A bit, like, a bit. Like from here on out. Well, Brad loves Night of the Roxbury. Yeah, basically, we're we're gonna be like in a very mid to low <laughs> range until we get to MacGruber, pretty much. I mean, Night of the Roxbury is. Uh, you you were a defender. No, of that. no, I, 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 I'm excited to rewatch it. I've not watched this. I l- there I l- are some real laugh. I love Night of the Roxbury, but I also recognize that it is it is a mid tier. Also, a uh, hidden gem in that film, Nate, Dan Hidea. Yeah, that's okay. true. Hilarious. All right. Yeah. Not so not so hidden. Lonnie Anderson's boobs. Okay, <laughs> you're you're not wrong. Yeah, because they she keeps them popping all the time. <laughs> keeps them popping. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, so Nate, what is the next movie on our Saturday Night Live cinematic journey? So the next film we're going to be watching is a film not produced by Lauren Michaels. Uh, it's it's Pat. Oh, okay, so he Star- was smart enough to stay away from that. One. Yeah, <laughs> starring Julia Sweeney, Dave Foley, Charles Rocket. Do you think that and Kathy Griffin? Everybody involved. In the production was like shit <laughs> because like <laughs> Lauren had done this first four, you know, and they're all properties, and then he's like, you know what? I'm just gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pass this one on. And this has the rare, um, kind of the rare rating on Rotten Tomatoes of zero, zero percent. Oh, mm-hmm. Boy, I'm so looking. Well, I'm sure to this. it hasn't aged very well. <laughs> Variety Is there a negative? This, <laughs> Variety magazine called this film shockingly unfunny. Oof. Well, uh, you know what? I think I'm going to go upstairs and watch it right now. Oh. That's a good It's Pat. Yeah, I know. There. <laughs> All right. 
So yeah, we'll be back uh, after watching. <laughs> it's Pat. Apparently, that'll be our next episode of the Ten to One podcast. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Uh, if you like Saturday Night Live, be sure to tell your friends about this podcast. Make sure you stay tuned because we'll be letting you know whenever Saturday Night Live is able to come back. Hopefully, these strikes end up uh, coming to an end sooner than later. And we'll be able to recap and review new episodes of Saturday Night Live. But in the meantime, we'll just keep plugging away at these Saturday Night Live movies and working our way through Saturday Night Live history and talking about uh, things that we like. Fun with friends. And dislike about some of these Saturday Night Live movies. Fun with friends. Fun with friends. Fine. Good video. <laughs> <laughs> you were being so judgmental. And then you fucked up the only I line did. you have. I was. Uh, be good to yourself. Be good to others. Bye.